All right, well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this, uh, what is a Dharma Canberra branch meeting and um, just acknowledging uh, thanks to Andrew Smales, who, who is um, uh, the person who put this together, member of the Dharma National Committee. And of course, um, you know, as a Canberra branch meeting, we're broadcasting or sending it out as a webinar across the country. So um, thank you to everyone who's joined us, um, you know, uh, around Australia. My name is George Basili, for those of you who, um, who I haven't met, and uh, I'm the president of Dharma Australia in 2021. We're really, really delighted to, um, to be able to bring you internationally renowned data management guru, Peter Aitken today. Peter has uh, obviously kindly accommodated our time zone and, um, and uh, agreed to, uh, to see us in this morning for a, for a coffee. Um, I'll just do a little bit of house housekeeping first, bear with me. Um, we'd like to just start um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognising their continuing connection to the land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Just a quick plug, um, coming up in July is the first sort of really Dharma focused Dharma sponsored conference. So um, uh, quite a few of us are uh, presenting there um, and uh, Dharma Australia is getting right behind uh, this event because it really is an event that um, uh, encompasses a lot of the, the DM Bok. Um, it encompasses a lot of the practices we talk about. And I really encourage anyone out there um, to either uh, register and attend online. There's some fantastic speakers. Um, and, or if you're in Melbourne, um, you know, there's the option to, to go and attend and that's what I'll be doing. So I'm really looking forward to attending this event and speaking at it. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, international speakers as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's certainly uh, an event that uh, if you're in data management, um, I would encourage you to uh, look at attending. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce Peter. So Peter is the Associate Professor of Information Systems at Virginia Commonwealth University. He's also the Associate Director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers, and he is the current President of Dharma International. Peter is the author of 10 books, or it could be more than 10 books now, I'm not sure, but at least 10, on data management. Um, including the first one uh, on the role of chief data officers, so the case for data leadership, um, and the first describing the monetization of data for profit and for social good. He was also one of the first authors to write on modern data strategy. Peter also ho hosts one of the longest running data management webinar series, uh, which is hosted on dataversity.net. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Peter. So I'll just do the, um, I'll just do the change. So if you just bear with me for a sec. So I will, I think the you sharing. can just share your desktop. Is that right, Peter? I can, exactly. I wanna make sure I optimize for the video and share the sound. And I'm gonna ask for some participation here. We're getting started just a touch late due to technical difficulties as usual. And, and George, please correct me, but I think this is what you just advertised, correct? That is, that is what we just advertised, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So I also was told to make sure the slide went up as well, and it has been <laughs> up, and I doubly endorse it as well, everything that George said on that. So thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you all for inviting me to, to speak with you. As most of you know, uh, at this point, I will go anywhere and talk to anybody about data for any particular reason. Uh, I've been twice to uh, your beautiful country and, and not spent still enough time on this, and certainly recommend this piece highly. Uh, but I mentioned interactivity. We always have an option of trying to finish on time, which those of you that have heard me know I'm perfectly capable of speeding up and talking faster. So the question is, do you want me to finish at seven? Uh, sorry, that doesn't make any time. At the top of the hour for you guys, uh, not here, the bottom of the hour for you guys, um, or would you rather hear the full program? I'm happy to do it either way and, and have no problem, including splitting it into two parts. If we get into that, I'm happy to make it interactive if people have questions. Um, I, think we'll, um, I think we'll try and stick to the time allowed. Schedule. We've got people uh, starting their work day today. 
Um, so some of them will um, no doubt have meetings at 9.30 and so on on this end. So yeah, if we can, um, you've got about 45 minutes, Peter. Nicely done, we'll do it properly then. So anyway, thank you all for inviting me in. And without further ado, let's talk about the subject at hand, which is data literacy and the entire organization. Uh, thank you for a terrific introduction there. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff. There's a, a bit right now, Steve Hoberman, who's the chairman of the conference that we just talked about as well, is offering a, a event pricing on this. So if anybody has a, a need for books for stucking, stuffing stalkers or stuffing stalkers, <laughs> stocking stuffers. There we go. <laughs> well, that's a weird one. Sorry, my third webinar for the day today, guys. Uh, but again, real pleasure to be with everybody. Let's start out with um, some American sports. How about? When Zion Williamson's Nike sneaker busted open on the court less than a minute into Duke's Wednesday night game, the star forward went down hard. And so did Nike. The company's stock sliding on the news, closing the day down nearly a point, losing an estimated billion dollars in now, value. Now, let's pick on Nike, a very fine company. And I do not have an association with them. Um, I've been you know, visited a couple of times and spoken with people. But um, I do know the process that occurred was that they originally said, oh my gosh, we've got a terrible data quality problem here when that shoe bust within the first couple of minutes of the game on a product that's supposed to help athletes play better. And in this case, it looked like the product injured the athlete. Uh, yeah, that cost a billion dollar drop in, in stock valuation and that's a, a problem. So they looked and tried to find where that went wrong. And this was the, the thing they looked at and it's like, oh, it's right there, right? Well, they find out that looking right there really means they're actually looking right there because it's dependent on other places. They can't just go to the first place they find it. And then from there they go and, and oh my gosh, there's some external data over which we don't have control over. And, and then there's this dark data. Dark data is officially defined now as the part of data that you never analyze in your organizations. And that represents in many cases uh, upwards of 50% of your data uh, that's out there. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But what, what this takes us to is, is that trying to learn, trying to assemble this information in response to a crisis is much, much worse than being proactive about it. Uh, it's just difficult to learn from anything in a crisis state and being dependent on the data of others is very uncomfortable. There's a, a, a big disconnect, therefore, between the, the classwork and the data and statistics skills needed beyond the classroom uh, in this case. And that's sort of the topic we're addressing this morning. Uh, why can't Johnny read is the question. And that's an old joke on American bad education system. Uh, why can't Johnny read and what can you do about very famous book from the 1950s, which spawned, of course, a series of books. Nothing actually has changed. Why Johnny still can't read. Uh, same author. Another author comes in and says the real reason why Johnny still can't read, why Johnny can't read, write or do arithmetic even with a college degree. Uh, you know, there's just, so I, I decided why Johnny can't data or really what we're doing today is data literacy on this. And it, it's pretty straightforward. I'll go through this as quickly as I can because I'm speaking to a bunch of data professionals here. Data's complex, data's role in society is increasing. The assessment of today's approach is that we're not doing what needs to be done, uh, getting us to some hopeful insights uh, around that. And then a business case, in this case, asking the question, if we could make our knowledge workers productive, just as a class of workers, if they were literate in data concepts to a certain level, what would that mean? And I think the answer is quite a bit, but one of the reasons I'm doing this is to get some push and some feedback. So uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to is perhaps not today, but uh, certainly discussion at some point about your, your reaction to this. Uh, I'm going to present the next piece that says we can't think about data literacy as a monolithic concept, that there are, are some clear, objective, delineable levels that are there. And I'll give you that information. What I've done in the new book that, of course, this is based on is describe specific citizen data literacy needs that need to be met at each of these levels. And I'll talk about some of the challenges uh, around all of that. And, why I went in that particular direction. Depending on time, there's a couple of examples we may be able to get to to, to take a look at uh, on all this. And uh, I'll, I'll, I know it's breakfast, so I've probably, uh, you don't want it too much detail on things. So I'll try to sort of lighten up on, on terms of where we're doing on this. Let's just start off with the, the idea that if we don't really get uh, what's actually happening? Whoops, we're not breaking that. That's another. There we go. Uh, we're going to get started just looking at the the first piece of this. All right. So the idea is, Gartner wants to give you sort of ten easy ways, and I'm not a, a 
terrible Gardner fan or foe. They, they put out some good information, but they're still presenting you're either data literate or you're not. And I, I challenge you all to, to figure out another way to deal with it that, that is more objective than what I'm describing to you. Um, and they, they mentioned that data culture is important, and I certainly agree with them on that point. Um, love, of course, George Box's quote. Remember, he says, all models are wrong. So what I'm presenting to you is hopefully something that you will constructively criticize and give me some feedback and so that you will find some utility out of what we're doing uh, around this. So uh, a question that comes up, you know, when you have to ask organizations what's been going on, is data being treated well? Well, this is a, a little list from Chris Bradley, a colleague. Uh, you know, he says, do executive positions support it? Does the organization usage track uh, of this? Does the organization control the asset? Does the organization controls executed? These are very objective points that you can look at uh, to see what's happening in each of these areas. It's a, a, a very challenging process. And what it means is that if people don't understand to treat data as an asset. We now have this challenge of when this kind of question comes up, which may have been more recent, uh, sorry, may have been earlier than, than more recent, but still if demand for service at a 38 bed hospital is doubling daily and somebody goes, oh, okay. At what point does anybody notice that the hospital beds are becoming scarce? So on Monday, you've got three beds that are occupied. On Tuesday, there are six. Wednesday, three quarters of all beds are available. This is not gonna be an issue. Yesterday, half of all beds are available uh, to get at what you're trying to do. And then today, of course, we have zero beds. And the real question is, what goes on tomorrow? Uh, people not able to understand this type of math, people in leadership positions cause terrible things to happen. So we've, as I mentioned, been looking at data literacy as sort of a binary thing. And I do want to acknowledge there's been some very good work here. I'm not sure what's happened to it, but a combination of Click and Accenture have gotten together and done some really innovative research around this and posted it for people to take a look at. So it's good, solid stuff. But unfortunately, their website doesn't look right. So I tested out as a data guru on their take a self-assessment training, which seems to still work. But when I went to the next step, I got a 404, which is sort of an oopsie kind of thing. Um, that's it. There is some good hard statistics around this. And in fact, the federal government takes track of it. We in the US have called it the National Association of Adult Literacy, and it changed recently to the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies. Bottom line on all of this, those are just two names that you need to use to look up all the, the information about it, is that it addresses objective literacy from a ability to written text in the blue, to be numeric in the green, to be purple digital problem solving. And most importantly, of course, there is no statistical difference between the years in which data has been increasing at an increasing rate. So uh, I'm gonna skip over a, a bit of this and, and go to the, the part that I think you need to, to start focusing on. So give me a quick section here to, to jump ahead a couple slides, uh, give you the bottom lines on all this. Um, the old definition of data literacy is, is difficult uh, to do this, and you'll get a copy of that. But I, I did want to pay uh, homage to Amos Tversky, who said something through a Malcolm Gladwell audio book that was just fascinating and, and helped us sort of figure out this problem. So if the, the, the way of defining data literacy, according to Wikipedia, and a lot of people use this, is the ability to read, work with, analyze, and argue with data. That's a very broad challenge. And so really the concept of literacy should focus on competencies that are you're able to do. Uh, it's, it's just amazing what we don't know about each other's respective sub data disciplines, but these are widely available uh, in here. But it's not similar to the reading test uh, on all this. It, it just can't be binary. So that's why I said the Tversky test uh, in here. He, he said something fascinating. Uh, all documented actually in a Michael Lewis book called The Undoing Project. But his, his words here were, when presented with new information, I do not think to myself, is it true? But I ask myself, under what conditions can it be true? Uh, that led to an insight for Todd Harbour and myself. Todd's been my uh, partner in crime writing these books and doing the research for the past uh, half a decade actually here. Um, what we need to look at from a data literacy perspective is that hundreds of millions need educating and we don't seem to be making progress around this. And just 
describing it as literacy is not the correct term to describe a, a, what really needs to be a graduated approach. So we think there are some levels here, maybe a prerequisite to becoming a mobile, uh, we call mobile data spreaders is what we call them, um, to become an adult data spreader, to learning about knowledge work and trying to work within that context, to make a different class of data teachers. There really is a, a very specific need here that's going to require more than university level focus. And, and finally, broader research on today's problems by data professionals. So let me take you through sort of a graduation here just to see if this makes sense, first of all. Um, when we talk about literature, you can also look up and see some synonyms are proficient or acumen. So if you have the opportunity, literate goes the ability to read and write, having or showing knowledge of literature, which would kind of give you the idea that you could use the word data rate, and that's probably not good. Um, I like this, characterized by skill, lucidity, polish. You know, that that's, doesn't sound bad. Having knowledge or skill in, uh, are you computer literate? If you can do a Zoom meeting, you're computer literate. Uh, as a noun, it's a person who can read or write. But that's that's going for the binary. Now, if we look around at proficient, and the, the first thing it's hard to find not proficient. Uh, so those are just sort of some jokes there. But proficient is well advanced or competent at an art science subject. Uh, skilled, which is good. Uh, but if I go further, acumen, keen insight, shrewdness, remarkable acumen in business matters is the ability to discern or judge very well. Given, given a choice, I would absolutely take uh, the idea that we would go for acumen type of expertise around data. We don't just people who are good at it. We want to attract people who are interested in it, can develop this keen insight, this shrewdness, this remarkable acumen for using data in business managers. And that doesn't sound to be pretty bad. Let me just give you a quick overview of what's not working uh, on this. This is from a wonderful survey that if you haven't seen it, it's uh, Randy Bean and Tom Davenport, newvantage.com. They've got the entire set of these things out there. This is a very quick summary of it. But are you being innovative with data? They've asked thousands of people uh, years in a row. And 49% this last year, 2020, decided that they wanted to do this. They're calling it the 2021 survey. So 49% less than half. Notice a pattern here that we'll see. 60% thought they were doing it in 2019-64. This is the same companies, the same officers that are being asked this. Obviously, there's going to be some change, and they document all this quite well. It's a great survey. Uh, are you competing on analytics? Notice the same pattern. It doesn't go up, but it still is trending downwards, and we don't know why this trend that you'll see continues is occurring, but it nevertheless is occurring. Hopefully it's occurring because people are getting smarter about it, what it means to be data literate around this. And it's certainly a, a very curious topic. So hopefully that's drawn you to some interest this morning here. Anyway, are you managing business as a data asset? Again, up to 50% in 2020, but down to 39% last year. Creating a data-driven organization, 24% down from 38, forging a data-driven culture. Again, you can see it's been a bumpy ride. But we're at our lowest point, uh, less than a quarter believe that they're doing this. And one final result that's important to deserve a slide all on its own uh, is the idea that when you're asked to classify what percentage of challenges that you're facing are technology and what percentage are therefore people on process challenges, the results are entirely consistent. Since 2018, the people on process challenges far outweigh technology challenges. And this is something we have to, as a profession, change in our, our um, communication with the rest of the organizations that buying technology has not generally solved problems and will probably not continue to solve problems. Buying technology is a necessary component, but it's probably uh, one of the last things that you should dive into rather than one of the first things. And unfortunately, management gets it in their head that buying technology actually gives you some results uh, around there. And it can, but it's, it's generally a, a more challenging type thing. Uh, jumping on here, we're going to go and take a quick look back at the survey that we were talking about, the Data Literacy Project. Uh, and again, this is data that they came up with that said that workers who report a significant amount of time spent in mainstream education learning how to use data in the workplace, 17% in the US, I'm kind of surprised it's that high, but I'm pleased, it's not where we should stop. UK, 10%, India, 52%. 
this may be something we can take a look at. These results are only a couple of years old and give another window into the same type of thing. The, the next set are, are, are asking the question, as a knowledge worker, do you have access to specifically designed data tools? And these are the reports. So in science and technology, leading the other areas, public and governance. And in the green now, um, are you having access to skill level appropriate technologies? And again, you can see education leads the way with it. Sorry, science and technology leads the way education followed behind. It's again, not good, but of course, what we're really doing is changing the axes here. So I'll, I'll put it in a, a better context just so that you can uh, see. Uh, there's additional measurements that we can get into. One, one last set that I'll leave you with, there's, there's some others that I'll include in the deck. Um, but when you ask around, we see that 14% in general have a good understanding of how to use business data, which is, remember, called part of our not really objective definition, but at least 14% have opted into that area, and, and most have opted out. Minority of young people are classifying themselves as data literate, a very minority, and yet we walk around with these um, devices that make them look uh, invisible, quite frankly. So future employees are, are vastly underprepared for the, the data-driven workforce that's coming upon us. Business decision makers around an executive table, 24% um, will, will say no, but uh, the, the other 76% will pay individually to become more quote data literate whatever that means they just don't want anybody else around the table to know that they're asking for it and again that's four out of five uh, that are there so we've, we've got to make data literacy programs explicitly available to executives as being forced on them by the board of directors again business decision makers 33 percent are able to create measurable value 27 percent uh, are able to say my analytics project produced actionable insights those are tough numbers. They're very realistic. 78%, eight out of 10 are willing to invest time and energy and their own money into improving their data skill sets around there. These are important numbers to, rep to, to me because it's not just our knowledge workers that need educating, it's everybody in the organization. And in fact, if we go further out, it's, it's all knowledge workers. And an easy argument to the contrary, well, you know, what, what is it that we teach knowledge workers about data? My definition of a knowledge worker is somebody who works with data. The answer, of course, is we teach them nothing and 100% of them use it. Seems to me that's a really good inflection point that we can apply some knowledge and abilities and skills and, and make a difference and, and look at in our organizations. I believe very shortly your organizations will start to select from among two candidates who other things being equal among those two candidates, they will find a way to discover and invite on board the more data literate candidate. This is in all positions that involve knowledge work and it'll happen very, very soon. You can hold my feet to it and uh, likely you will, which is one of the fun things about working with you all. Uh, what do we teach IT professionals about data? Generally one thing, which is how to build a new database. What impression do people get as a result of that? The impression that they get is we don't need data people. And we have, again, objective scientific evidence that shows that data people used to report in directly to executive leadership and have since have moved three levels downwards in the organization. Uh, and that's as a result of this in incorrect approach of giving them one solution to all problems, which is build a new database not a good idea and not always called upon to make data decisions and it isn't a news flash to any of you that as a result of this we have set up a situation where business and technology decision makers are not data knowledgeable and they make therefore bad data decisions this is unfortunate because those bad data decisions result in poor treatment of organizational data assets and poor data quality. As a result of that, you have poor organizational outcomes. And of course, what we want to do is get out of this never ending cycle. The way we're going to try to approach it, at least for the next 30 minutes, is from a very simple business case. The idea is, again, these knowledge workers are pretty objective. We can define them. We can certainly define categories. One of the things that may not be obvious to you initially is that truck drivers, if you haven't been near the trucking industry recently, have become, um, I won't say unfortunately knowledge workers, but it is tough to survive out there. Tr truck driving, long haul trucking uh, has become a, a 
monitored, uh, managed process, it seems to be producing higher safety results. Um, that seems to be a good direction. There's many, many more uh, things we need to look at, but who would have thought a couple of years ago that truck drivers would be knowledge workers? Things are, are changing now on, and that gives us more leverage as we're looking to it. So the, the question becomes, what if? What if all of your organizational knowledge workers were one hour more productive a day. Now, we wrote this before the data came out and said, you know what, as a result of not traveling in and out to work, many of us have become an hour more a day productive, and you're giving half of it to your family and half of it to your work. That's very interesting. Just on this number here, though, uh, resulted in a Ring Central study that said, goodness, 32 days a year uh, can be a, a very high number for some people, but it is is something, you know, toggling between applications too often uh, on underpowered computer wastes 60 minutes a day. That's a, a, an incredible thing. And using numbers such as this, what you end up with is 20 days and not recreating knowledge, 10 days in better processing email, five days navigating between apps, and five days induced data procrastination and sick leave. Um, yes, there is sick leave that arrives as a result from something like that. It's unfortunate, but it uh, certainly does happen uh, around that. That translates into a 16% increase, and I think it's kind of uh, interesting to go after. We do have some work to do to see whether we can deliver on that promise. It is absolutely a promise, not a proven uh, at this point. And again, I'm looking to you all to come back to me on that and give me uh, feedback around that area. To take that just a touch further, there's a, a no cost, no registration, free download case study that dives into this in excruciating detail and is absolutely guaranteed to put you to sleep at night. Uh, download it if you want to go a little further uh, around that concept uh, in, in there. Now what we're going to do is actually look at the framework because that's really what you're interested in. What could you possibly do to divide the world up into these concepts? Well, first of all, Pew released a right on time study showing that we have very few people that aren't one in 10 that are not on the internet. And uh, you can draw conclusions from that. Uh, how much data comes out, I'm, I'm going to actually uh, not bore you with that. I said I was going to go right to the bit. And that is that when you look at what's happening around, you end up with such an amount of data that is not productive in your organization. Now, this is a wonderful book. I highly recommend you get it on your Kindle uh, if because you likely get it for free uh, on that. Um, How You Make Sense of Any Mess is a wonderful $10 uh, book about data architecture, information architecture, excuse me, Abby. Uh, she begs to differ and, and that's fine. But she makes the point, obviously, that better organized data increases in value. And if you have trouble defending that proposition, uh, just go back to the book, which was well before the information age. We incorporated these types of metadata structures on books to make them useful. Uh, imagine if instead of that, I ripped the spine off of the book, chopped all the page numbers off and distributed randomly pages to everybody that's listening in today, that knowledge would distribute and certainly would not increase in value. Poor data management, therefore costing our organizations time and money. And yet redundant, obsolete and trivial data clogs our systems. They get in the way of decisions that we're trying to make. And the only argument I have gotten in 30 years is that it's not 80% for our organization, Peter, it's 85%. I had one organization tell me that 92% of their data they were convinced was rot. But of course, everybody's afraid to eliminate any aspect of it because it's, uh, well, if you don't understand it, you, you certainly don't value it correctly, right? In that context, the idea is that while well, data is a wonderful asset to have, again, the way to describe it is your sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic level asset. And, and that gets us towards concepts around these assets compared to other assets are favorable in different ways. I don't like calling it data as the new oil. Oil is a production function. We're a reuse function. Those are different. I like to say, let's go to the new soil. Uh, putting that S in front of us gives us two things that are good for the people to think about from a metaphorical perspective. One, it takes time. One doesn't just randomly scatter seeds about the yard and expect good results. Uh, two, one carefully prepares the, the context. Sorry, two, uh, one doesn't prepare plant things on a Monday and expect to eat them, harvest them on a Friday, unless perhaps one lives downwind of Chernobyl. So these are things that we have to keep careful of and make sure people understand as we go forward. But you're right, you do need some sizzle uh, to that. And, and it's important to show successes and become successful storytellers around it as well. But data does deserve then its own strategy attention that is on par with other 
organizational assets, and finally, professional administration to make up for past neglect. Because unfortunately, the public perceives us as an organizational data machine. What is that? Well, it's a thing that from a citizen perspective, anything I give the organizational machine, they're processing and anything that comes out of it is uh, based on data and their organizational thing. And we've all faced this eternal challenge. If we relegate everything to fully managed enterprise level standards, it, at least at the moment, is too slow and requires uh, a complex bureaucracy and does not produce value in the process. If we do too little, we miss opportunities. And, and the key then is the idea of interoperability. The, that's where you determine value. The more value you can get from an interoperability perspective, the easier it is to determine data that can benefit from that. One additional concept that we did introduce in the book is this concept that those organizational data machines are often connected via the other clause that's in all of our end user license agreements with the uh, big six that we deal with on a regular basis and perhaps big nine uh, that they may share data with other business partners and that creates the data matrix which just allows sharing uh, these data properties are really problematic because there's a general low data literacy even among data specialists and i hate to uh, be as blunt as that, but I've, I've met far too many data scientists that say to me, oh, thank God you put my work in context. I've been trying for 98% solutions, whereas I realize in this industry, a 55% solution would be an excellent, excellent solution. Uh, tons of data already exists, but not all of it is, of course, valuable. But the good stuff, if we can separate it, is uniquely valuable. And that creates a situation that we haven't cared for data in the past, so we sort of have a before and an after world that we need to change. And the after world is about data debt. And that's what we need to address. It's going to take time and return data from a generally ungoverned state or an unknown quality state or every, other types of unknowns that are worth resolving and getting back to sort of a zero state, undoing some existing stuff, learning some new skills, and, and getting to zero, then starting from scratch, requiring an annual proof of value. And now you get to do everything. It's a, a tough process, really questionable at this time of the morning, why you guys are even listening to me talk about these things, because it just sounds like an impossible task. Well, let's, like everything else, break it down into pieces. Seven billion people in the world, good first starting point, sure. Of those, two and a half billion have a mobile device connected to the internet. Wow. Of those, a billion and a half are adults. And of those, a billion are knowledge workers. That's the size of the audiences that we, I think, need to aspire to as data professionals. And I've built this approach as you've worked with me previously on this and seen on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which started off very simply and said that, uh, you know, if you have food, clothing, and shelter needs that are unmet, you will never be safe. If you're not safe, you'll never be part of something that is bigger than yourself. If you're not part of something that's bigger than yourself, you have trouble defining yourself in relation to the other, and that is your own self-esteem, leaving you an ability to achieve self-actualization at the top where you are. Now we, if you look on TED, this is called flow, F-L-O-W. The same pyramid structure then applies here to our data civics framework. At the bottom level, we have the mobile literate, the adult, the knowledge workers, the teacher acumen. These are not to scale, and the adult acumen. More importantly, when we put them kind of next to each other for comparison, we can treat these two as a group. These are individual rights. We can cajole, we can put pressure on parents to make their children literate, but I don't believe that we as a society yet have the ability to force a certain level of literacy on them. But we can perhaps by social pressure. If somebody, for example, their uh, uh, address book was constantly hacked and you were constantly getting bombarded as a result of their hack, you would probably unfriend them to some degree, and, and that will close their behavior. It's kind of virus-like uh, in, in the sense of that. These other group, though, we can, and I predict will, control their behavior through a code of conduct that you will sign at the beginning of your employment. I predict that will happen within five years, that it will be largely the norm. Organizations will figure this out, and everything at this level should be required of data scientists and cyber professionals who oftentimes learning after the fact of our complementariness in our professions find areas that we could have worked together and done truly collaborative research and uh, sorry uh, 
collaborative development and avoided uh, uh, significant uh, duplicative costs around that. So, whoops, sorry. <coughs> I'm sure that was too fast. Um, we're not going to go through the whole thing. I'll save you to look at this later. But what I've characterized, and again, I should say we because Todd did a lot of this work with me, and it was just terrific to work with him, uh, is characterized below the red line of business we can't control, the behavior we can't control. But there are some influences, and we tried to characterize it and sort of tell a little story with it. I think it's largely, but the, the top part, by these codes of conduct, we can say that we can govern your data behavior. Now, we may have to wait for Supreme Court decisions to say whether does that cover at home, but I don't believe there's a controversy of being at work. Let's look at the first level instead of trying to strain our eyes with the detail. Uh, again, mobile, and the keyword there is to surf. Uh, again, that's what you do when you pick up your phone the first time. You go, wow, oh, cool, yeah, mobile device, iPad. We give them younger and younger. And, and there's one productive mind there. But what you want to do is avoid being fooled, avoid being a, a what we call a mobile data spreader uh, in that type of a context. And so learning about things such as cookies, gosh, as young as possible, we can do. And Full disclosure, I have zero kids here, but I can certainly imagine that a, a productive conversation of a parent might be, um, look, Junior, here's what happens with a device log. If you happen to be in real life uh, lifting the device handle, the, the device will log the device lifted. And if you enter a phone number and dial, uh, it will say manually entered phone number. And if we notice a police car and hang up the phone, it will say call was terminated. You get the picture of the car stopped by the police. Yes, it's ride and it notes, hey, you got a parking space, right? Uh, record the conversation with the policeman and start recording with a copy to the cloud uh, as far as you're doing this. Wouldn't you rather it speak this way? Hey Siri, uh, call the person, notice the car stop, please stop, record the conversation with the police officer and Siri can then describe the process that yes, of course, he was being hands-free compliant with the law. Failure to pay time and attention does not apply in this particular case, but kids knowing that this detailed level of logging is kind of important and we're gonna to have to leave that decision to parents. I mentioned for each of these, we had defined a corresponding pair of citizen data literacy needs and citizen data literacy requirements. And these are objective, oh no, these are objective uh, pieces by which we absolutely wanna make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Again, as George Box said so aptly, this model may be terrible. Only half of this stuff may be useful, but gosh, let's get it out there. Try it. See if we can get that to work. Okay, I'm going to give up on that. I've clearly had way too much caffeine today uh, on this. Level two, remember, this was the adult data spreader in this. Again, the superpower that they really had in addition to that digital trail is the ability to vote in society and to change the rules. And that's very, very uh, important to understand in a context. Uh, again, in our country, we shorthand it and bemoan the fact that we don't teach civics anymore in school. I certainly am old enough to have had it, but apparently the rest of them did not. And we get this sort of idea that this impression, this, this, um, bit is just as important as who you are in real life and potentially the income or the, the interest could be much greater than that. So who you say you are and who people, who you say you are and then what people say about you uh, becomes a very important concept in there, but it can't become the only concept. And so as adults, the best we can do as a society is to try to adopt some sort of general framework that says these are things that adults should have conversations with kids about. Uh, you know, understanding what an online reputation is. And, you know, in high school, we used to say this will be on your permanent record. Some of you may remember an Alice Cooper song with, with those lyrics in it. Uh, these are very, very different in that concept. And we have to understand that this is the where our our, our young people are interacting and the more data literate that they are, in this case, I'm describing this uh, at the second level of height, not at the data literacy level, but uh, again, at the um, human level. I think. No, I can use the top one. Terrible having a senior moment here, guys. Going to my cheat sheet. 
Okay, never mind, I won't find it quickly. Let's go to level three instead. We're getting to the end here now. Uh, level three, remember, can be provided, grouped, to do certain things in common. All of these groups can be influenced, and I don't mean controlled, but we can proscribe behavior, we can prohibit behavior. There's a number of ways of doing this, and there's a whole field of ethics study and codes of ethics that we should get into in this. That will inform part of the decision around this, but everybody from L3 on up can be subject to an organizational code of conduct around data ethics and around data usage. And that behavior can be focused. Uh, organizations may choose to take certain stances uh, and then hopefully not get called out if their reality doesn't match their public stances uh, around this. Rather than dive down that rabbit hole though, let's talk just briefly about something that Tom Redman invented called a, a hidden data factory. And that is the idea that these work products go into department B from department A. And as a course of their action, they just make corrections against it. What a terrible thing to do. And then they complete B's work, send it to the customer, where still perhaps there's a learning process that goes. And these, these hidden data factories pervade our our entire existence in many production situations. And that organizations aren't aware of the cost of these things because poor data manifests itself as many different organizational challenges through IT systems, through business processes, and the type as we look around this. Again, nobody looks at Salesforce and says, oh, somebody put bad data in a good customer relationship management system. They say instead, oh, I don't like what Salesforce is giving me in terms of results. They have in common poor results. And at the bottom level, of course, a data problem is a part of any business challenge as well. The idea here is that we should really focus on this knowledge work productivity, whether it's something as simple as removing a click from a repetitive process, tallying the number of clicks around that, or describing the impact of that uh, on the environment. Those are all important. Now, I did mention ethics, and, and just to, to let people see here, you know, maybe making math, weapons of math destruction uh, required reading at the board level, uh, certainly at the executive level in terms of that, and just understanding that perspective on things. And, and better still, that there has been some fascinating work done at the Open Data Institute around data ethics, and that they've done a lot of this uh, to take it very, very far. Um, I had some bit that I was going to do on, on digital stuff. I'm going to uh, skip that for just a, a quick minute and merely make an observation that, that my colleague Mark Johnson made the other morning uh, when we were on a, a panel that I, I thought was deeply insightful about this. We just said that, you know, if you subtract data from digital, I'm not sure what you've got. Uh, on the other hand, if you subtract digital from data, you still got data left over there. And that as an insight really shows the key role that data plays as a, a, a source of garbage in, garbage out processes uh, around that. Uh, and again, it's, it's very, very straightforward when you look at what happens uh, on this. We have garbage data and we have a wonderful model here and then we have garbage results. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether the thing in between is a web data warehouse or machine learning or business intelligence or blockchain, AI or data governance or analytics or anything around those areas. It just doesn't make a difference. As long as you're feeding it with garbage data, you can't expect anything other than garbage results. In fact, it's mandatory to replace the garbage data with known quality data so that you can harmonize your data flows, stop sending the same thing to the same place twice in a row, uh, send good data to your, your hard worked processes and technology that you have, and then expect something in the way of results that, that will help everybody uh, go further and faster. And again, I, I put these knowledge, uh, citizen data, uh, uh, leader, excuse me, data literacy, data uh, needs and, and requirements as a pair together here. So, so uh, again, just, oops, gosh, I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, go fast through that. There we get it. Gosh, darn it. Uh, I really think I'm watching the right screen, but I realize I haven't got that information on the other screen. So I have to wait for it to turn from green to red. Anyway, there, it finally stares on the screen. All right, so as a knowledge worker, we can now require aspects and may productively require in the near future aspects of 
aspects of data stewardship in the future, which throw in the horrible, horrible uh, sounding word fiduciary relationship uh, into that. Uh, so there's some objective characteristics that we can say, you know, what is the, the thing about getting this particular uh, data set or, or, or understanding that you have access to these particular places, it's going to play a more and more important role, particularly as the legislation aspects of this continue to increase in their relative importance. Level four, we're almost done here, guys, are the data teachers. Uh, our system currently has not produced, does not produce what we need to have in here. We need to take this on not by investing billions and billions of dollars in artificial intelligence, but by making our general population here much more literate, much more fa much faster uh, in the process. And, and we need a different form of education that's very concentrated and very focused in this. And, and if we look at what's happening at the moment, 50% of capital investments are IT-based uh, in these areas, but we don't teach people enough about it. 80% of the IT costs, though, are involved in rebuilding systems in this. And, and again, our, our future workforce is, is not understanding the things that they need to be used useful in the future. They are not even told the existence of things such as case tools and, and uh, data dictionaries and, and, and network types and things like that. In fact, in many cases, they're still being given the example, uh, you know, calculate the seek, disk seek access time uh, on this. And, and they don't know the people giving the, the question is that the disks don't rotate, but the students do know of all of this type of process. Uh, again here, sounds like I'm, I'm making a race for the last. The, the number of citizen data literacy needs and, and um, uh, requirements on the other side dwindle at this level, but we still have specific knowledge that we're using all of the things that we can, including uh, uh, the same kinds of things that we're asking our other classes of knowledge workers to endure in terms of measurement and, and, and checking on, but hopefully we'll find a way to do it with the right types of privacy so that we can gain quickly and learn quickly, rapidly, how to focus the teaching in the right areas so that we can measurably improve some of the scores, such as the ones that I gave you before because organizations will very quickly figure out how to test in addition to all other things being equal to candidates of all different types, but mostly around data professionals, that they may have degrees on one hand, which is great, but when we add that up against their more holistic perspective about what they do, um, they, they are lacking in certain areas around this. So again, we, we get the idea that the data professional is has a purpose of improving data usage and use uh, around the area. There's a, a uberizing potential uh, in all of these uh, areas because there is a, a chance to make a difference in society, but unfortunately, it's like the blind people with the elephant where they have a fan, a, a snake, right, a tree. Again, different people know different parts of it, but we need to make this holistic perspective and just defining it the way we have of everything between source and use is, is totally insufficient here. So we've got to go more in depth around that and say, no, we also need to include the concept of reuse in here. And that's more difficult. So just, just sort of closing in the area of saying what needs to be done here. I want to put this one piece up and then jump very quickly through a, a series of interesting oopsies, which I guess will solve for our case study tonight. That's the idea that we, we define the two areas of data here as engineering on one left and exploitation on the other side with subdivisions in there governed by an ethics framework. And that gives us the use part of it, but we still need to go most cases to formalize the reuse component of it in here. And that's critically important uh, to pulling all of this together. Now, unfortunately, the, the, the process of understanding how all this works doesn't seem to, to really get into the general population. And so just very quickly here, I'll move one, one specific example here to, to, to diving into it and tell you that the, Doug Laney's done some great research telling why companies are more valued if they have this kind of uh, skill around it than not, which is just wonderful. Uh, I'm going to take you to January 6th of this year, uh, where we had a group of people that attacked our capital. Uh, and the first question that was asked was, were they the people who said they were? Well, they were using collectively a social network called Parler, and Parler had terrible data security and was hacked right away. So that data was dumped out on the internet and the URLs were connected with people and pictures that were posted showing that there were people who were on Parler at the Capitol. It didn't look like an Antifa situation. Uh, people also tried to do the opposite of that of giving you the URLs here. They then 
put a connection to each portion, portion of video, news clipping, anything else they could find, so you could gain a different perspective around it. That was the coding that was done here. Then finally, ProPublica, which is a, a pro, pro uh, uh, information group, published a timeline that you can actually drag along here and find out different things that were happened. And there was finally one other piece on here, which was sort of illegally obtained data, where the Trump supporters were down here near the rally, and then they moved to the Capitol in quite obvious fashion with illegally obtained data, but still published nevertheless. So I've, I've run through this very, very quickly. It's out of time here on this point, but to get 21st century citizenry, we actually need to increase in very specific objective ways and do it in a way focused in an area that can help organizations save time and money. And that's a wonderful thing. I've given you a framework. It's probably wrong, but I hope you'll give me feedback on it. I know we don't have time for it now because you have to run to work, um, but I appreciate you giving me a chance to babble at you for a, a few minutes and, and look forward to seeing some of you, if not all of you in the near, near future. Don't forget, of course, about the conference. And uh, how about that, George, right on time? Oh, perfect, Peter. Have you got time for a couple of questions? I'll stick around for whatever one, anybody wants, of course. Okay, look, I'll, I'll start um, and then I, I'll read through a couple of questions. But thank you very much. Um, I'm actually looking forward to sitting and watching that video of this, um, which is um, available to Dharma members. Uh, if anyone wants to have a look at it, I think Andrew will be putting it up. Um, but you've got so much of um, this, such a rich presentation. And I think there's so many things that uh, I, I certainly am looking forward to going back through. And uh, um, yeah, and uh, if, if, if you're interested, um, I, exchanging some, um, some thoughts as well. But um, um, one of the things you talked about was organisational culture, which, um, you know, as you said, was, you know, um, very, very important. And I think you had the slide that's saying, um, you know, culture trumps, um, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. Well, essentially cultures, you know, a very, very important part of the recipe. I'm just um, curious what sort of things you've seen uh, done successfully, because um, clearly we've done a really good job you know, making the tools available and, and the data available to people when they, you know, they come out of school, you know, they want to get their hands on the data and, and, and start, you know, predicting things and analysing things. But, but on the other side, there's a very low understanding of data management and, um, you know, the, the possibility that they could be creating, you know, another source of truth or a problem. Um, what sort of um, things have you seen um, addressing that in organizations and, um, you know, uh, especially from a cultural point of view. From a specific fundamental point of view, George, it's the idea of the elephant. Uh, again, we've got so many different perspectives on data. I, I talk to data scientists. I have, I have a course literally called data processing in the middle of their data science program. And the students are kind of pleased when they take it because they're like, wow, nobody's ever talked to us about, I think I mentioned before, a 55% solution would be huge increase over what we have right now. We don't have to go for a 90% solution. That makes a, a tremendous difference in their context. And we're not giving them the general education uh, within the business world to, to understand this. So recognizing that the processes are, are important uh, and beyond simply checking a box that we have bought a technology and it'll, it'll work. And my, my favorite example at the moment is, is poor salesforce.com. I can't tell you how many corporate boards I've been in front of who say, oh, so data governance is about making sure we clean the data before we put it in salesforce.com. And the answer is only if that meets your strategic objectives. If your strategic objective is on time um, over, you know, a good experience, then, then, by all means, uh, go for there. But it, it's a very difficult challenge around that. Okay. I've got a, uh, if anyone has any questions, please just press the Q&A button and post your question. And I'll do my best to get through in the next minute or two that we've got left. Um, I've got a question from Andrew Andrews, who's actually the Vice President of Dharma Australia. How many universities get the need to teach data literacy to undergrads and postgrads like MBAs? How can we influence universities to start teaching data literacy? That is a concept I think that maybe DAMA as a profession might want to consider. Um, I happen to be president at the moment, which is lovely, but it doesn't work that me says something and then therefore it happens, right? Uh, so it's a concept I think that, that's worth exploring further because 
maybe unknown to you all, but we have passed a law in this country called uh, the Federal Evidence-Based Policy Act in January of 2019 under President Trump when the government was shut down during one of those periodic fights between you know, the good guys and the bad guys or whatever's going on. And uh, they, they actually understood specifically what was uh, taking some of the DIMBOK and, and not necessarily codifying it in the law, but when asked what standards, they were told to use best standards, and they said, what are standards? And they said the DIMBOK. Now, that's not technically a correct answer, but it's the answer that they're getting. So I think the chance is actually quite good. So I appreciate the question. Again, I know you're out of time, but it's such a pleasure to, to briefly connect with everybody, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do it in a more relaxed form in the near future. Okay. Um, I'll throw a, a couple more at you if you've just got oh, a second. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't know. Can level five of your, um, I guess, literacy model be automated through machine learning or AI? Wow. I have not considered that issue. I don't know. Good question. Okay. okay. Um, and um, I have um, a final question. I'm in the process of teaching data literacy for our organization's data. Uh, for new starters, do you have any advice that you can provide? I think, first of all, we did scour, I think, the entire base of literature from a number of different sources, and there just hasn't been a singular approach so far. So while I'm putting this out there, I'm saying I've got something that seems to make sense to me. I'm asking for your all confirmation because who better to ask than a group of data professionals who live and breathe this stuff? Uh, whether this is capable of making a difference uh, around this. And again, I look forward to your feedback. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you to everyone for making time um, and uh, you know starting your day with us this morning. Thank you, Peter. Um, a great presentation. And I'm, as I said, looking forward to um, having another look through it. Um, and I really appreciate um, the, the fact that you've made time to uh, address our uh, audience today. Um, don't yeah. forget the conference if you're in, if you're not a Dharma Australia member, I'd really encourage you to go to dharma.org.au and join. Um, you know, it's less than a hundred dollars uh, tax deductible, <laughs> and um, you know, it's an excellent community to be a part of. Uh, we run events in all the capital cities, and um, you know, webinars like this one. It's a, a great way uh, to network, to build your career, to educate yourself, and and um, have access to a lot of resources and and colleagues who work in the same field. Um, thank you for thank you to everyone. Thank you to Andrew Smales for putting this together, and um, hope to see you at the next Dharma Australia webinar or in person meeting. Um, don't forget Melbourne as well. I just remembered Thursday 5 p.m. Batman's Hill, um, uh, which is on Collins Street. You can see the details. Uh, the first Dharma Melbourne branch meeting in about 18 months. So our first post sort of lockdown type um, get together. Looking forward to seeing some of you there. See you later. Thank you.